So these are the basic functions right here, sine and cosine. Now we're going to go for all the reciprocal ones. And I'm going to start with, there's a buzzing sound. Is that bothering anybody but me? OK, I'll pretend that's not bothering me, and we'll keep going. So we'll look at reciprocal functions. So I'm going to do a really, really fast review on reciprocal graphs, although you've known them as a different name. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a different section in the book, so I'm not going to write the number. If one of you flips open your book, is it still 10.5 or is there a 10.6 graphing? It'll be secant, cosecant, tangent, cotangent. So I'm just going to write graphing. So we'll go secant and cosecant. So can you graph the function g of x equals x? Yes, you can graph g of x equals x. So go ahead and graph it. it takes two seconds. All right, very exciting function. And what we're going to do is take this graph, and we're going to use this graph to graph f of x. Now, this is not a transformation. Uh, that you've studied before. This is not a shift, a stretch, or any of these. What we're going to do is graph the reciprocal. So we're going to graph, instead of x, we're going to graph 1 over x. So it's going to have all the same x-coordinates, but our y-coordinates are going to be the reciprocal of what they started. So what number is its own reciprocal? There's some numbers. When I take the reciprocal, they don't change. 1. So 1 divided by 1, still 1. So let's think about those numbers. We'll say they're right about there. That's 1, minus 1, and we chose those. You didn't say minus 1, but you're going to. Negative 1 reciprocal is negative 1. So those two points on the graph that I plotted, they're also going to, on their reciprocals, they're going to appear in the exact same place. So the reciprocal of 1 is 1 over 1, which is 1. So we can go ahead and plot those two points up here. So we got 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. All right, the next easiest number I can think of to reciprocate is probably 2. What's the reciprocal of 2? 1 half. So it changes, but not by much. So where's, so that's 2. 1. So 1 half, we'll say, is right about there, halfway up to 1. And let's go ahead and do 3. So y coordinate 3, reciprocal 1 third. Now we're getting pretty close to the x axis. My pen is really bold right here, so I'm not going to go past 3, or it's going to blend right into the x axis. What would happen if I kept going, though? So I'm going to get closer and closer to the x-axis. So if I did 100, I would get 1 over 100, which with this pen would look like it was right on the x-axis. So we're going to do connect these three points with a nice curve. Whoa. Now if I draw the way it should look, it looks like I turn into the x-axis. That's not really accurate. I don't ever hit the x-axis. I get close to it. So we're going to do instead of that. I can't undo. Oh, it's not good. Stroke eraser. Good. All right. So what I'm going to do instead. Oh, I'll use a thinner pen. So I'm going to draw. So definitely connect these three together. But what I'm going to do now is just draw an arrow like this. Just say it's going to go in that pattern. 
Now we would get a horizontal asymptote normally, but our trig functions aren't going to have horizontal asymptotes, so I don't want to focus on that right now. What I want to focus on instead is what happens, the same part of the curve, but if I go to the left. So we'll do one half. What's the reciprocal of one half? Two. So I'll flip that over and get two. So one half will be up at two, right about there, connect those two together. And what happens after that, if I did a third or a tenth, I would get the reciprocal. So those numbers start to get really big. The y values get very big. So my x values get closer to zero, but my y values get really big. So the pattern is going to look like this right here. And we get what we call a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So x equals zero is our vertical asymptote here. There should be a review from pre-calculus class. If you graphed on a calculator, hopefully you're following along with this graphing by hand right here. So let's look down here. What point corresponded to our vertical asymptote? I'll color it in blue. What point am I going to color in? the same x coordinate. So it's x coordinate 0, y coordinate 0. So 0, 0 is what turned into our vertical asymptote. I'll draw this vertical, a dotted vertical line in blue. So our old x intercept turned into a vertical asymptote. So that's one of the reasons this transformation is very hard to see, because x intercepts turn into vertical asymptotes. Now, what happens on the, if we make the left curve over here, the left half of this graph, it's going to look really similar where you're approaching the same vertical asymptote, but you're going to approach on the other side. So I still have my vertical asymptote right here, still x equals zero, and I'm approaching from the negative side when I have the left part of that curve. So still, that came from the point the x-intercept turned into a vertical asymptote. So that's the important part of the story you need to remember. X-intercepts, when you reciprocate, turn into vertical asymptotes. So x-intercepts turn into vertical asymptotes. when reciprocated. Recip... How do I spell that word? Somebody passed English in here. It's probably not correct. It starts with an R and ends with a D. I don't know what comes in between. So reciprocated. All right, so if you take your uh, y equals 0 coordinate before you reciprocate, you're going to divide by 0, have undefined. There are some other nice points we saw. The easy points to think about, when y is 1 or negative 1, they don't move. So I'm going to write that down too. Points with uh, either y equals 1 or y equals negative 1 are stationary or are fixed. They don't move. So this idea we're going to take and apply to the cosine graph. So wherever was 1 or negative 1 is going to stay, and whatever was an x-intercept is going to turn into a vertical asymptote when we reciprocate our graph. So again, this is not a, trans a continuous transformation. If you wanted to turn this graph on the bottom to the one on the top, you'd have to get out a pair of scissors, cut it right at the middle, and you'd have to stretch it way up here. So this is not something that can be deformed continuously. So it's not like a shift or a stretch where you can imagine, oh, I'm just going to move it over, or oh, I'm just going to you know, increase it in one of the two dimensions. So it's not something you can do with the zooming in one dimension or 
uh, shifting. So it's very different than all the other transformations. Um, and it's not a continuous one because you have to get out a pair of scissors and cut it. So you can't just do it in a continuous fashion. So that was all review right there. You probably didn't think of the uh, 1 over x graph as based on the x graph before. So you may not have thought about it like that. But if you remember rational functions, if I graph a rational function, still in blue, if I graph uh, some rational function of x, Right here, you know there's two vertical asymptotes, x equals 1 and x equals negative 1. Those are the two that make you divide by 0, right there. And if I did the 1 over r of x, so if I reciprocate this function, we have a polynomial. Very easy to see the two x-intercepts right there. So x-intercepts of the reciprocal function turn into vertical asymptotes. All right, so back to trig. So this is all basically uh, pre-calculus one review right there. So we're going to graph. We started with cosine, so I'm going to go secant first. And we're going to graph it based on the fact that it is 1 over cos x. So we're going to take the cos x graph that we know, and we're going to take it and reciprocate it. And I'm going to graph the coast graph on top, and then we're going to graph the reciprocal graph underneath. So we can line up all the x values will match. So cosine starts at 1. Uh, 2 pi will be back at 1. Regular pi, we're halfway in between. Pi, we're at negative 1. X-intercept, and then connect it together. So there's one period of cosine right there. So you should, you should either have this memorized already, or you should be planning to have it memorized for tomorrow. You should get a quiz, and it's going to require you know not just cosine graph, but sine graph. Uh, there'll be no reciprocals on tomorrow's uh, graphing test, or graphing quiz. So you won't need secant, cosecant, any of those. All right, in blue, I'm going to mark the points that will turn into vertical asymptotes. And we'll label them pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. Now the points that I left at the black marker are actually going to stay where they are. They have y value 1 and negative 1. So they're not going to move anywhere when I take the reciprocal graph. The blue points are going to completely change. They're going to turn into vertical asymptotes. So we're going to graph our secant function below. And I want to make this graph a little taller because it's going to go way past 1. So graph the black points first the three black points, the blue ones are not going to stay where they are. So I don't want to graph them right now. So with the blue marker, I'm going to mark the pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. So those are, is it easy to see blue and black? It looks pretty easy. All right, see the difference? So those two blue markers are vertical asymptotes now. So I'm going to draw the dotted vertical lines right here. And if you have a second color pen, a lot of people just use another color for asymptotes instead of doing dotted lines. But however you want to do it. If you've got a uh, driver's license or student ID, you can make nice straight lines if you want to. 
So we're going to draw our vertical asymptotes. Right there. And we're going to label them. We know what they are. They're right above. Pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. I know what the uh, x values are. So we got pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, right there. All right, so I'm going back to the regular black marker. I just wanted to go blue for the asymptotes. So I'm going to go back to whatever color you're in. And now I'm going to draw the graph. So when I do that, let's pick another nice point. One half has a really nice reciprocal. It's two. So I'm going to use one half as my other point to help me out. So right about there. Now, right about there is where it's happening. It doesn't happen halfway between 0 and pi over 2. It happens at exactly pi over 3. So it happens 2 thirds of the way over if you want to get super precise. So you don't have to be that precise here, but if you want to measure it fully correctly, you should be going a th 2 thirds of the way to pi over 2 if you want your graph to be accurate. And that'll be 2 right there. And we'll say that's right about two thirds there. So I need to connect these two points together and approach my vertical asymptote. There's really only, only one way to do it. And it's going to look like that right there. So there is zero to uh, pi over two. So any questions on that first part of the graph? We did a quarter of the period so far. So we're about to move into that middle section. So in the middle section, we're going to play the same game where the easy y value to think about, is, well, negative 1 is the easiest, but the next easy one is negative 1 half. So I'm going to think of negative 1 half, and then where are those points going to go? So there's negative 1 half, negative 1 half y values. What is a reciprocal of negative one half? Negative two. So negative reciprocals stay negative, positive reciprocals stay positive. So if you were above the x-axis, you're still going to be above the x-axis. If you were below the x-axis like we are now, this is all going to be below the x-axis. So that part of it doesn't change. There's no real flipping going on. It's a really hard operation to see in your, in your mind because it's not continuous. Basically, the closer you were to the x-axis, when you reciprocate, the further away you're going to be. Uh, and vice versa, where the hard part is, if you're a distance one away, you don't move. So if you're closer than one, you're going to get further. And if you were further than one, you would get closer. So again, very hard to see. That's why I'm using numbers. Numbers are easy to reciprocate. So one half is going to, negative one half is going to turn into negative two. And just do my best to go thirds right here. So we got third, negative two, other third, negative two. So we got to connect these three points with a curve and approach the two vertical asymptotes. So this is going to be an upside down U, or an intersection symbol if you're into set notation, or a sad parabola. Parabola is not the right word, uh, and I'll show you why in a minute. So they're going to be connected. like this right here. So that's the second part. So from here, you should be able to see how to draw the last part of this period right here, the last quarter of the period. So go ahead and draw that out. And you can, of course, use the other 1 half value right there, reciprocate it to 2. So you can do that also. That graph looks pretty nice, actually. Nice smooth curves. So this is one period of uh, secant right here. This is one period of secant. 
So I'm going to redraw it without all these marks all over the place, just using one and negative one, and clean it up and make it a little smaller, and then I'll put a box around it and say memorize. You don't actually have to memorize this. If you can memorize the, or if memorize, if you can memorize the process of reciprocating a graph, you can just go right off a of cosine and then draw your reciprocal graph right here. So you can either memorize the way the graph looks, or you can memorize the process that we took to get there. So what's the best way to memorize a process? You just do it, and then do it again. So you're going to see in your book, there's graphing problems that are obviously uh, secant and cosecant. You practice those. The way I strongly recommend you do them, graph the cosine. And we'll do this in here. We're going to graph the cosine, and then find the reciprocal graph off the cosine graph. You can graph them on the same exact graph if you want to. I graph them above and below, but you can graph it on the same graph. And if you do that, the way I like to do it is use a dotted. So if I fill in where the actual cosine function would be, it would look like this right here. So you can use this sort of as a blueprint to lay out where your cosine function will go. And if you're using a pencil, you can just graph it really lightly, come back and erase parts of the line, or however you want to do that. Just make sure when I'm grading it that I don't see it filled in completely. So I know, oh, he's talking about the, you know, the part that's not dotted. And of course, that's one period, which is 2 pi. And that 2 pi period is inherited right off the cosine period right there, because everything is based right off the cosine graph. All right, so if you're a memorizer, we'll just write one uh, period down here with a minimal number of uh, markings. So we're going 0 to 2 pi. We have our vertical asymptotes right here. x equals pi over 2, x equals 3 pi over 2. Uh, we have pi right in the middle. And we'll go with 1 and negative 1. So I'm going to draw some bad secant x graphs that I've seen before. That's sort of right. The problem is there are no y values of 0 or even anything closer to 0 than 1 or negative 1. So you need to keep it away, keep it off the x-axis. So don't do this. Uh, I've seen even worse. I've seen, uh, well, instead of drawing it down there, I've seen people draw it like going way up like that, where they're actually crossing over, repeated. Uh, the, some y values that are crossing over here. So just make sure that you know. If you can think of the process, of going from cosine to the reciprocal, that's probably the best way to do it for most people. And let's do an example here.
And when I ask you for graph, uh, I'm going to ask you for the period, the phase shift, and any other and any of the vertical transformations. I'm not going to put too many vertical transformations in because they're usually pretty straightforward. If you made it through pre-calculus one, you can handle vertical transformations most likely. So I'm not going to ask you uh, much about vertical transformations. So it's mostly just going to be horizontal. So let's write down our period and our phase shift. So is the phase shift pi over 2? Nope. So I have to first factor. So when I factor, what is left over? Certainly factoring out a pi. Let's do guess and check math. Let's try, uh, just get the pi out of there and leave it as a half. What do I get when I multiply? This will be 2 pi x minus what? So it'll be 2 pi over 2, which is just uh, minus a pi. So that's too much. So I need less than a half. And what I really need is a quarter right here. So I know I'm going to multiply by 2, so I need to unmultiply by 2 right there. And now I can check. Negative 1 fourth times 2 pi is negative pi over 2. So that gets me back to where I started. All right, period. P equals 2 pi over A. In our case, A is 2 pi. 2 pi over 2 pi is 1. That's a little strange. Period is 1. That's OK. What is our phase shift? You can answer that question now. What is our phase shift, our horizontal shift, left to right? So we're going right because it's negative. How much am I going right? One fourth. So one fourth to the right. All right, so we're ready to graph. Period one, phase shift one fourth. What I'm actually going to graph is cosine all that stuff. So I'm going to graph the regular cosine function, and then I'm going to take the reciprocal. And I'm going to graph it with a dotted line. And then we're going to go and do the reciprocal after that. So this is time to test your graphing skills. Can you graph that function, the cosine function? If you feel good about your cosine function, go ahead and take the reciprocal graph right there. So I'll give you two minutes to do this.
and I do want X values labeled. So there should be, well, I should mark the one right in the middle, which is three fourths. Now you don't, I went with uh, reduced denominators or reduced fractions, I should say. You can actually go with common denominators everywhere. So we're pretty much in fourths from the beginning. So if I kept everything in fourths, I would have had two fourths and four fourths as my X intercepts. And I'll write those out. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to, but yes, I won't penalize you for using the decimal system. I think the easiest way is, is use common denominators in your fractions. If you want just the easy way to do it and least chance of making mistakes. So the fate, basically the period being the pi was taken out of the period because of that pi that was in the original. This pi right here meant that my period had no pi in it. It naturally would, but because, I'm, because of the uh, horizontal uh, stretching, or in this case compression, uh, it was compressed the exact amount that it doesn't have pi in it anymore. So one way to think about it, it got 2 pi smaller. So it started out being 2 pi, but because I multiplied by 2 pi, that has the effect of shrinking it 2 pi as much. So what was 2 pi is now 1. Um, now it would be a little, little bit ridiculous if I put phase shift as maybe pi over 4. That would be really annoying because all your x values would be would have pi plus a fraction without pi in them. So that would be a little, in my opinion, crazy to do that. You may, that may very well happen in real life, but this is a pre-calculus class, not real life. So I'll give you problems that are nicer. Now, of course, this is not the only period. This is just one of the many. So if I drew more, and I'll draw more in, I'll just keep drawing them in, in blue, I would get another vertical asymptote right here. So it would go like this, and I would get another vertical asymptote right here. And then if I kept going to the right, another vertical asymptote, and get that part of the graph, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can just take this pattern and keep repeating it as far as you want either direction. So all that blue is not part of the single period graph. That's multiple periods being graphed. So again, if you struggled graphing the original cosine function, that could very well be your quiz question tomorrow or something just like that. So if you struggled with that cosine graph at the beginning, that is basically your quiz tomorrow. Might not be that function, but there's only cosine and sine, and I'm going to put a phase shift and a uh, change the period. That's it. There's not very many options for me to put make your quiz tomorrow. So I'll do the same thing for cosecant, and we're of course going to start with uh, the sine function. So sketch graph of sine to begin with. I'm going to graph these right on top of each other, just using the dotted line method instead of making two graphs. All right, so see if you can draw your sine graph up right now. Give you a big hint. It begins at 0, ends at 2 pi.
So there's your sign graph, and if you feel comfortable reciprocating it, go for it. If not, you can just copy what I draw down right here. I kept my graph pretty clean, so I'm just going to use this as the one to memorize right here. If you want to redraw it for the one you memorized, go for it. But I'm pretty happy with the way this one looks right here. Now, one of the main differences is basically there's an offset. It's a very similar to the secant graph. You just start it in a different place. And this one in the standard period has three vertical asymptotes because you have one at the beginning, middle, and end, whereas the other one had two of them because they were sort of in the, the quarter and the three quarters of it. So there's our cosine, or our whew, cosecant graph. So why, I said this is, looks like a parabola, but not a parabola. So if you draw, so why is this not a parabola? Why are these not parabolas? All right, I could say because I told you so, but that's not good enough. If you draw a parabola, you draw it probably almost the exact same way. Let's take the easiest parabola I know. Y equals X squared. Is there an X value that you can't go past? So is there some maximum X value that would have a vertical asymptote that something different would happen afterwards? No. So one of the main differences is the parabola goes as far to the right and the left. It goes all the way, arbitrarily far to the right and the left. So the parabola doesn't have a uh, vertical bound on the side. So there'll be no vertical bound. So they're drawn similar, but if you kept going, the parabola would not stop going. It would keep going to the right. It would not stop at any x value.